Okay, thank you, Blair, for inviting me for this opportunity. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'll have uh, a brief talk, uh, new updates in uh, management of hyperglycemic crisis, including BK and uh, HHS in adults. Uh, this is a uh, uh, timely and a special uh, topic uh, this time for uh, three reasons. One, uh, we are celebrating the 100th year of uh, insulin discovery. Insulin was discovered in 1921, uh, so now is a one century old drug. Uh, the other is uh, we have recently celebrated the World Diabetes Day, uh, and there was uh, shocking uh, data showing an increasing uh, uh, diabetes worldwide, uh, especially the developing countries, including uh, Ethiopia. The third reason why this is timely is uh, I have been attending uh, a meeting recently that Ethiopia has received more than 50,000 doses of uh, insulin, including insulin analogs. So we should uh, know how to use it in uh, DK and HHS states. This is the outline of presentation. We will have uh, we will see the epidemiology of uh, hyperglycemic crisis, how it happens, the pathogenesis, some uh, clinical and regular life features, how to treat it, and uh, some of complication of therapy. So if you have, uh, if you guys have questions, you can uh, write it in the chat box or uh, uh, stop me anytime. Okay, so I will start the discussion with a case. The first case is a 20 year old uh, a man uh, who was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes two years back. He's on multiple daily injection, uh, basal and uh, bolus insulin therapy, and he ran out of insulin two days ago. This is an actual case. And he was he presented with an abdominal abdominal pain, uh, some other dry symptoms with uh, uh, significant His symptoms and uh, his mentation was uh, getting worse since the day before. On admission, uh, the vital signs, uh, his BP was low, he, he has tachycardia. Uh, he, he is tachypneic as well, uh, a low grade fever, his mentation is drowsy, and he has also uh, generalized abdominal tenderness. Uh, 50 milligram per day, he has mild leukocytosis of 18,000, the L higher range, uh, and he has also creatinine derangement with uh, uh, urine ketones, strongly positive 3 plus, and uh, metabolic acidosis. So, what do you think is the diagnosis here? You can unmute yourself and answer. Okay, so, uh, so it's good to have uh, uh, his type 1 diabetes, he ran out of insulin, so he has insulin deficiency, uh, he has feature of uh, dehydration, tachycardia, he has feature of acidosis, tachypnea, form of uh, stress features, metabolic acidosis, ket uh, ketosis. So this is uh, a diabetic, a case of diabetic, uh, classic diabetic ketoacidosis, okay? So sec the second patient is a little bit atypical, is a 47-year-old including uh, uh, dapagliflozin. He was on a strict diet for weight loss, he presented with several days of uh, some urinary tract uh, symptoms with poor oral intake. He had similar UTI two weeks prior which, which, for which he was treated with antibiotics. On presentation, his febrile, his tachypneic, uh, tachycardic, uh, BP is on the higher side and uh, saturation is okay. His R base was uh, lower than the previous patient, 200, 215. Uh, creatine is okay. The ABG shows um, acidosis with uh, with uh, uh, three plus ur urinary ketone and blood ketone positive as well. So some some of the physici treating physicians think uh, he might have uh, misdiagnosed type one diabetes. They sent type one diabetes panels. GAR sixty five antibody test was negative. C peptide uh, showed L, uh, uh, preserved C peptide level. So what do you think is is this decay or not? 
Okay, the RBS is mildly elevated, only 215. Any of you guys can unmute and have a say on this. Hello, Dr. Vlaku. Okay. Uh, this patient is on uh, SGL2 inhibitors and uh, they, they may develop ketonuria. And the, even with low blood sugar, they may develop a decay, I think. Okay, excellent. Dr. Abdu, says? Yeah, yeah, Abdu. Okay, excellent, Dr. Abdu. I brought this case because nowadays we are seeing more between relatively newer agents, uh, including the EU glycemic uh, diabetic ketoacidosis. We will have uh, a discussion on this. Okay, you might see cases like this uh, in terms. The third case is an elderly guy with uh, long standing diabetes on oral medication. Uh, he presented with uh, diabetic foot ulcer with uh, worsening of poly symptoms uh, and generalized weakness. On uh, examination, he's, he, he's hypotensive with uh, uh, right ulcer. His maintenance was and the RBS measurement was greater than this. So is this uh, a diabetic ketoacidosis or uh, HHS? And so this is a classic case of uh, HHS with uh, mental status change, severe dehydration, and uh, significant stressor upon this case later on as well, how to manage this. So hyperglycemic crisis are acute uh, metabolic decompensation of uh, diabetes mellitus. Uh, so decay is caused by threads of uh, hyperglycemia, uh, ketonemia, and uh, acidosis, whereas HHH hyperglycemia is uh, more severe than decay with uh, uh, high serum osmolality and, and dehydration, okay? Or lit and little or no uh, uh, ketonemia, okay? Their common feature is absolute or relative insulin deficiency with uh, volume depletion and Acid base abnormalities. Okay, this is uh, about a little bit about the history of uh, decay management. As you might remember, uh, insulin was discovered in 1921 uh, by uh, three or four young physicians. Uh, before that, diabetes was, uh, especially type 1 diabetes, was a fatal disease. They die of uh, diabetic ketoacidosis uh, in short weeks or menses. Uh, after that, after insulin discovery, uh, uh, there was several algorithms of decay management. The initial algorithm was includes uh, high uh, use of high uh, so high insulin uh, therapy was adopted for decay, but later on, uh, a lower dose was found to be equally effective with lower complications. But the first comprehensive guideline on decay was, uh, was, was put forward in, uh, in, in recent years, 2001, by the American Diabetic Association in the UK guidelines followed, okay? Now we have uh, many RST evidences about uh, the, dose, the doses and the roots of insulin therapy uh, and about fluid therapy, okay? Nowadays, we have very low uh, decay mortality. So uh, a little bit on epidemiology. So uh, decay is characteristically associated with type 1 diabetes, but it can occur with type 2 diabetes, uh, with severe stressors, or uh, even as a presenting initial type 2 DM called ketosis prone DM or KPDM. OK, classically type 1, but it's possible with type 2 DM. Uh, whereas HHS is characteristically uh, uh, happens in elderly type 2 diabetes, uh, about the mortality, decay mortality is very low, less than 1%, whereas HHS mortality is uh, 10 or 20 fold higher than decay. Okay, it's because of the severe dehydration, elderly patients with severe comorbidities. Okay. 
So this graph depicts uh, the hospitalization and mortality of DK in US before some uh, five, six years. So the solid graph uh, indicates the so there, the, there was initial decrement up to 2010. After that, there is an increment in the hospitalization, but the more or uh, uh, less than one percent nowadays, close to one point uh, point. So the overall uh, host, uh, decay uh, point six per, uh, per uh, ten thousand admissions, and the overall mortality is about uh, thirty seven per ten thousand. This is close to uh, three point three seven percent. Okay. Look at some of the risk factors for uh, uh, mortality. Male sex is associated with higher risk of mortality. Being black is associated with higher rate of mortality and uh, with uh, increasing age, especially more than uh, uh, eight fifths, associated with uh, uh, very high rate of mortality. Plus, the form of payment, uh, those with insured and uninsured, in uninsured individuals, the risk of death is higher. This is a US data, more recent US data. Okay, why do you care? I think, yeah, Doctor. Uh, Am I disconnected, Vinia? I think we are talking about something. I want to go back to that. One minute. Host, host enable article. Host. Uh, yes, she doc. Yes, yes. Uh, enable article, doc. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me know. Okay, so it's good to know the, norm, the normal response to hyperglycemia. So when uh, glucose increases for whatever reason, the first response is uh, the beta cells, uh, is the, the pancreas is the center of glucose homeostasis. So there will be increased insulin from uh, uh, beta cells and at the same time, there, there, there is decreased uh, glucagon. Uh, glucagon should be suppressed uh, from the xylfacid. This results in, this results in uh, decreased, decreased glucose production from the liver, both the gluconeogenesis mechanism and the glycogenolysis mechanism is suppressed. And uh, there will be increased glucose uptake in peripheral tissues, especially the adipocytes and uh, uh, skeletal muscle. The end result is normal glycemia. So DK and HHS is opposite of this uh, this physiology. Okay, I'm not sure to how to hide. Okay, so uh, the opposite of that uh, normal glucose homeostasis is uh, uh, DK or HHS. I don't know how to make this thing go off. It's it's uh, covering my slides. Very low, Bakadok. You can continue. Oh, 
Okay. Uh, Okay, so there, when there is, uh, there are two things. Okay, so DKHHs are not just an insulin problem; it's a multi-hormonal problem. But the main abnormalities are uh, absolute or uh, relative insulin deficiency and increased counter-regulatory hormones, especially uh, glucagon. So uh, you know, insulin is the main anabolic uh, hormone that's responsible for uh, uh, lipogenesis, uh, uh, protein synthesis, and uh, glycogen storage. So when there is absolute insulin deficiency, there will be uh, activation of uh, hormones sent to lipase resulting in increased uh, lipolysis. This results in flux of free fatty acids to the liver and the liver changes them into, uh, uh, some of them into uh, gluconogenic precursors and they are into keto, uh, ketone bodies, okay? This results in ketoacidosis and uh, increases the gluconogenic sub uh, substrates that goes to the liver resulting in gluconeogenesis. At the same time, the peripheral, because of uh, insulin deficiency, the peripheral glucose utilization is decreased, especially in adiposite and mild, resulting in uh, hyperthemia. Okay, so high glucose results in uh, uh, osmotic diuresis with loss to uh, volume depletion and hyperosmolarity. Uh, okay, so uh, these are uh, increased ketoacidosis, hyperglycemia, and hyperosmolarity. Renal function uh, is the main uh, uh, pathophysiologic mechanism and manifestation of uh, DK and HHS. The difference between HHS and DK is that uh, in DK there is absolute insulin deficiency, whereas in HHS these are uh, type two patients with they have some pres preserved uh, insulin, so the insulin deficiency is relative. So ketogenesis. Uh, will not uh, will be uh, protected by very small uh, remaining amount of insulin so there there won't be ketoacidosis otherwise the other manifestations are the same uh, the other difference is hyperglycemia is more marked in hhs and hyperosmolarity is more marked with uh, uh, with dk okay this is a simpler uh, uh, diagram so when there is absolute insulin deficiency there will be uh, increased glucose from gluconogenesis, glycogen release, and decreased glucose utilization, plus hormone sensitive lipase will be activated because of uh, lack of insulin. This results in a ketone body formation, uh, ending in uh, leading to acidosis. Uh, whereas in uh, hyperosmolar hyperglycemic syndrome, the insulin deficiency is relative, uh, whereas the counter regulatory hormones are there. Uh, so the ratio will be uh, towards the glucagon. This results in hyperglycemia, but there won't be ketosis. Uh, there will be little or no ketosis because of uh, the little, uh, the preserved insulin. Okay, this is a simple diagrammatic uh, presentation to show you the ratio of insulin to counter regulatory hormone, primarily glucagon. So when this uh, balance uh, is towards the counter regulatory hormones, it results in uh, all the hyperglycemia, ketosis, and resultant uh, uh, metabolic abnormality. Okay. Uh, one question was, is glucagon really essential uh, for DKA to develop? It's not. This study shows, uh, this very small study in six patients with type 1 DM and four patients with total pancreatectomy done was studied and they uh, uh, look for if glucagon is really essential for DKA to develop. So as you could see in the first uh, picture, uh, insulin was stopped in both diabetic and pancreatic, uh, uh, pancreatectomized patients. So as you could see, the plasma glucose level uh, didn't increase in pancreatic uh, in, in operated patients, whereas in type 1 uh, diabetic patients, the uh, glucagon level increased. This was translated to uh, a higher or faster increase in uh, glucose level in diabetic patients versus uh, operated patients. Both of them has hyperglycemia, but the rate of hyperglycemia and the amount of hyperglycemia was less remarkable in patients uh, uh, operated patient means totally pancreatomized patients don't have beta cells plus alpha cells, right? So no alpha cells means low glucagon. This results in, uh, uh, was translated to uh, uh, ketosis. So in patients, pancreatomized patients, the uh, rate of ketosis development was slower, but they actually developed DKA later on. So it was proved that 
glucagon is contributory but not essential uh, for decay. But uh, mind you, when there's no glucagon, the rate uh, and the amount of uh, hyperglycemia and ketosis is, was lower and slower. Okay. The other question is why is uh, uh, hyperglycemia more severe in HHS? Okay. One thing is decay patients they come early with symptom of uh, ketoacidosis. The other is uh, patients with DK tend to be younger patients with higher uh, GFR with preserved renal function. So they, uh, they pee it out. They have higher glucosuria capacity limiting the severity of uh, hyperglycemia. The opposite happens in HHS. Okay, the other uh, question is why is ketosis not uh, in HHS while the pathophysiological mechanism is the same? Uh, this is due to the differential sensitivity, sensitivity of uh, fat metabolism and glucose metabolism to the effect of insulin, okay? So uh, very small amount of insulin is required to suppress lipolysis and ketogenesis, okay? Whereas uh, a very high amount of insulin is required to inhibit uh, uh, hyperglycemia. So a very tiny amount of insulin in uh, patients with type 2 type 2 DM with HHS prevents ketosis and lipolysis, whereas it won't prevent the hyperglycemia. Okay, so uh, what are the precipitant factors? These are the seven I's. Uh, the, all of these factors uh, start with uh, the letter I. So uh, the, it could be the initial presentation in type 1 DM or other type you in ketose prone uh, type 2 diabetes patients. It could be due to inadequate uh, insulin. You know, insulin uh, is, uh, is expensive, costly, and affordable to most of the patients, so they tend to ration it uh, with lower doses. Okay, they could the, the first patient, as you could remember, ran out of insulin a uh, few few days prior to his, uh, his admission. Okay, the other common precipitant is uh, infection anywhere. It could be in the urinary tract or the chest or uh, the foot infection, as you could uh, remember in the case example. Uh, the other is especially in uh, elderly uh, patients with cardiovascular disease, think of uh, cardiovascular events like myocardial infarction, stroke, or other cardiac uh, of, uh, cardiovascular events, okay? The other is pregnancy. Pregnancy is uh, ketogenic state. Uh, so uh, they could, patients with undiagnosed uh, unknown pregnancy could have, could come with uh, decay, okay? The other is perioperative stress. Um, uh, the other eye is uh, intoxication or illicit drug use like cocaine uh, can be can precipitate hyperglycemic crisis. The other is, as you could remember in the second example, drugs including SG, SGL2 uh, inhibitors uh, are incriminated in, uh, uh, in to precipitate decay. Other drugs, commonly drugs like glucocorticoids, High, high dose thiazide diuretics, or recently uh, in cancer medications like the immune checkpoint inhibitors can precipitate hyperglycemic crisis. Okay, these are some of the, the clinical features. Uh, so the, the, these patients have precipitated polysymptoms, polydipsia, polyphagia, polyuria, uh, with uh, uh, as hyperglycemia and ketosis worsens, the same as depression. They would have blood diffusion from, from uh, hyperosmolarity. They would have uh, deep, fast breathing uh, because of acidosis. They, will, they tend to hyperventilate, and the breeze will have uh, a smell of uh, ketone, acetone. Okay, it's like a nail uh, band, uh, remover uh, like place. Okay, they have uh, GI symptoms that could mimic acute abdomen. Uh, these are some of the clinical features that you guys know of. Okay, this is a summary of the clinical features taken from Harrison. They have uh, the symptoms, the, the precipitants, you should be elicited. And uh, on physical exam examination, they tend to have deranged vital signs uh, with, uh, with uh, acute abdomen-like tenderness and progressively uh, CNS depression. Initial laboratory evaluation in primary care setting includes uh, checking the random blood sugar, uh, CBC, CBC should be drawn for uh, to look for sign of infection. Uh, so leukocytosis more than 25,000 with uh, more than 10% uh, band cells indicates uh, infection. Otherwise, a mild elevation of CBC uh, uh, may not be indicative of infection because decay is stressful by itself to cause uh, leukocytosis. Okay, electrolytes should be uh, uh, sent, uh, especially uh, potassium level should be measured. Serum ketones, if possible, if not, urine ketones should be measured. 
renal function and if the setting allows uh, arterial blood gas analysis uh, should be done. This is important for diagnosis plus uh, to classify severity of uh, decay plus for monitoring of decay resolution. Okay. If in an elderly, uh, ECG is important for one thing you could look uh, until electrolemia. The other is we said that ischemia or uh, MI is a common precipitant, so you should exclude that. And you should culture everything, including blood, urine, and uh, sputum plus chest X ray to look for uh, focus of infection. Okay, so this picture depicts uh, the difference between DK and HHS in, in terms of uh, body water and electrolyte deficit. As, as you could see, HHS has more uh, severe volume depletion. Okay, the estimated water loss is close to 10 liter, whereas for that DK is half of that, close to five to six liter. Okay, so all the electrolyte arrangements, especially sodium uh, uh, loss is more severe with HHS. So these are some of the biochemical uh, diagnostic criteria for DK and HHS plus uh, cl severity classification for DK. Uh, so uh, the hyperglycemia, we have said that is more severe in HHS than DK, it's more than 600, whereas in DK it's, uh, it's between 250 and, uh, uh, and, and uh, 600, okay? Uh, whereas the uh, acidosis is worse in uh, DK, the pH is less than 7.3, uh, as you could see, uh, the severity increases uh, uh, the degree of acidosis depends as well, whereas in HHS, there's mild or no acidosis, okay? About ketones, there is significant ketosis in DK, whereas there's uh, little or no ketosis in HHS, okay? Uh, on the opposite, osmolality is severe with uh, HHS than uh, DK because of the volume, de severe volume depletion, okay? So it's hard, the hyperglycemic, uh, the DK triads, it's, it's characterized by hyperglycemia, uh, ketosis, and uh, high anion gap uh, metabolic acidosis. There are differentials to it. DK is not the only thing that causes uh, metabolic acidosis. Uh, the common differentials are uh, acute kidney injury, uh, alcoholic ketoacidosis, uh, and uh, starvation ketosis. Okay, so these are the three common differentials, starvation ketosis, alcoholic ketoacidosis, and uh, renal dysfunction. Whereas HHS is characterized by triads of uh, severe uh, hyperglycemia, more severe than DK, uh, significant pronounced remarkable volume depletion and elevated uh, serum osmolality with no or little uh, ketosis. Okay, we have said, and Dr. Abdul was saying about euglycemic uh, DK, so it's, uh, uh, it's a rare uh, complication from some drugs, and you guys should be aware of it because of increased prescription of SGLT inhibitors. Uh, so it's a decay with uh, uh, mild uh, hyperglycemia. It's often less than 250. It can occur either in type 1 or type 2 DM. Uh, and in the Western studies, it uh, accounts for 5% of uh, decay admissions. Okay, There will be less remarkable symptoms uh, and pronounced than specific symptoms. They could come with fatigue, malaise, uh, not the typical decay symptoms you know of. What causes euglycemic decay is uh, commonly is SGL2 inhibitor, but uh, significant starvation or carbohydrate deficit uh, limiting the rate of uh, hyperglycemia could result in euglycemic decay. Okay, in the longer fasting, starving, uh, those on ketogenic diet, remember, and second patient was on ketogenic diet trying to lose weight. Okay, those with eating disorder like anorexia nervosa, uh, uh, patients with diabetes, uh, with autonomic neuropathy and gastroparesis uh, has limited hyperglycemia. Patients with alcoholism uh, has limited glycogen stores, so the hyperglycemia will not be pronounced. Okay, and sometimes partial treatment. Patient could take insulin before, uh, after developing decay, they could take insulin before they came to the ER, so the hyperglycemia will not be uh, remarkable, but uh, metabolic and uh, fluid abnormalities are, are there, so you should treat it, okay? And sometimes that's SGLT test pregnancy, because of uh, excessive glycosuria, the, the glycosuria will be uh, minimal. Patients with CLD have, okay? 
So these are uh, some uh, mnemonics for you guys to remember what could cause uh, or what could precipitate SGL2 inhibitor induced diabetic acidosis, ketoacidosis in conditions that could worsen intravascular uh, volume or ketostrone states. Okay, this includes diarrhea, uh, uh, this exercise would predispose them to. Uh, volume depletion, and whereas reduced uh, uh, latent autoimmune diabetes of the adults uh, can predispose to ketosis. So you should choose your patients when you are prescribing SGLT inhibitors, especially stop it when there are significant stressors like hospitalization surgery, not eating well, okay? Now, five goals. Always, you should set goals um, so that you would uh, you would know when, when, and how to achieve them. Okay. The first goal in uh, hyperglycemic crisis management is volume repletion. Okay. Fluid, fluid, fluid is the first uh, the first line of care. The second goal is correcting electrolytes, especially uh, correcting hypokalemia. Okay, because it is a heart threatening uh, condition. The third is uh, insulin therapy, replacing the insulin deficiency. The other is uh, fixing the precipitants so that uh, if you don't fix precipitants, they are going to, the decay is going to recap, okay? And the other is managing complication related to your treatment. So, uh, patients with DKA, uh, uh, needs vigilant monitoring, especially severe uh, DKA needs an ICU admission. Uh, so the first thing is always securing the ABCs of life. You have secure airway uh, and oxygen supplementation uh, might need ventilation as well as needed. Then you say you should secure a large board IV line, preferentially double IV line, okay? You have to monitor the vital sign, your uh, fluid balance, uh, ECG monitor is important and neurologic status should be assessed every, uh, every hour, okay? Serum glucose should be checked every hour and uh, ketones and other biochemical tests like electrolyte, ABG, uh, should be monitored often, every two hours. Okay, this is an example of a monitoring chart. Uh, so this is uh, uh, filled out uh, every hour of patient progress, okay? Including vital signs, mental status, uh, chemistry, including glucose, ketones, electrolytes, osmolality, anion gap, uh, ABG profile, and the insulin, the root of insulin and uh, the dose of insulin infusion uh, and the, the type of fluid you are giving, the urine output and others should be uh, recorded and followed on hourly or uh, every two hours. Okay, so the first goal we said is fluid therapy. So fluid repletion is the first essential step in hyperglycemic care, uh, hyperglycemic crisis care. It's usually initiated with uh, an acetonic uh, saline because starting hypotonic fluid initially uh, worsens, worsens cerebral edema. So start with a normal saline, okay? You can change it to five uh, hypotonic fluid, like 5% dextrose if, when the blood glucose drops to less than 250, okay? Uh, mind you, hydration alone can uh, fix most of the problems, okay? It reduces the level of stress hormones and by this uh, uh, and increasing the renal perfusion uh, with glycosuria, it also improves hyperglycemia. So it's the first step, okay? What type of fluid uh, and how much to give uh, depends on the clinical patient clinical condition, especially the initial hour of uh, fluid infusion depends on if there is hypovolemic shock, you give uh, uh, bolus fluids and based on the hemodynamic parameters, you can repeat it. If there is hypovolemia without shock, you can give uh, 1000 ml within the first hour if they are evolving. Uh, uh, extremes of age with cardiovascular disease, heart failure, uh, risk of fluid overload, you should be, uh, you should administer fluids at slow rate. Okay, how to give subsequent uh, corrected sodium. Okay, if sodium. If there's uh, corrected glucose in blood, uh, is a hypertonic, it, it draws fl fluid from the intracellular space to the extracellular fluid. This dilutes sodium. So corrected means you should correct uh, for sodium. The correction is done 
uh, for every 100 increase in, in glucose above normal, uh, the sodium will drop by 1.6 milliequivalent per liter. So after correcting that, if sodium is low, uh, continue with isotonic fluid. If sodium is high, you can uh, give electrolyte-free uh, uh, fluids like uh, half NS or BNS. Okay, that's the second is electrolyte management. The most crucial uh, electrolyte is potassium. Uh, uh, potassium abnormalities are multifactorial in decay. Uh, one thing, insulin and acidosis uh, 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 sh sh shifts the, the potassium to the intracellular space. So there could be, there could be uh, uh, I mean, uh, a low, uh, I mean, a, a relatively normal potassium for a severe overall potassium depletion. There's urinary loss uh, and so on. So uh, it's very critical uh, electrolyte, okay? If potassium is below 3.3, give a higher potassium. If it's in the, no, if it's, it's even in the normal range, you have to uh, give KCL. Uh, the, only, the only time you don't give potassium is when it's high, in hyperkalemic uh, state, more than uh, uh, 5.3, especially when there is renal dysfunction uh, and no urine output, okay? If patient has abdicated urine output and you don't have electrolyte measurement, please keep potassium. The third is uh, insulin therapy. So uh, uh, you should delay insulin initiation until the potassium is above 3.3 because when you give insulin, you will worsen the hypokalemia as insulin will shift it into the intracellular space, okay? This could be uh, life uh, could result in life-threatening uh, arrhythmia, okay? And in most patients with uh, DK, a continuous intravenous infusion of human insulin or regular insulin is a treatment of choice, okay? The route is intra uh, intravenous uh, and the type of insulin is regular human insulin, okay? This is the most preferred therapy for a majority of patients with, uh, with DK, okay? There is no really uh, significant clinical advantage of rapid acting insulin analogs over regular insulin for uh, decay management. Okay. The other question is uh, what route of insulin is uh, recommended? Is it intramuscular, is it subcutaneous, or IV? Okay. Most of the studies for hemodynamically stable patients uh, show similar efficacy and, uh, uh, and safety. This is for mild hemodynamically stable patients. Otherwise, for severe decay patients, intravenous route is recommended because the subcutaneous uh, uh, route will not result in uh, reliable absorption because of the dehydration and, and so on, okay? Uh, so uh, intravenous insulin achieves, uh, you know, uh, steady, state, steady state concentration in faster uh, time and with more rapid decline in blood glucose and ketone bed, especially in the first two hours of treatment, okay? So when we are giving, then IV insulin therapy, especially in primary care setting where we want, when you don't have access to continuous insulin therapy, an initial uh, loading dose or priming dose of IV loading dose of insulin is recommended uh, to achieve the steady state concentration faster. Okay. Uh, what about giving IV, IV bolus if you are going to give continuous therapy is not clear and probably it's not going to be beneficial. Uh, so these are the references for the evidence. Okay. So come, beside intravenous, uh, continuous intravenous regular insulin is a treatment of choice for DKA and HHS. How much to give is, uh, uh, it's often started by uh, giving 0.1 unit per kg IV bolus initially followed by uh, 0.1 unit per kg per hour continuous infusion, okay? You can prepare insulin in normal saline or hypotonic fluids in one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, for example, you can, Add 100 units of insulin in 100 ml of uh, normal saline. Okay, then you, uh, you plug it to the, to the perfuser. So uh, what effect do we, we, do we expect after giving this amount of insulin? Uh, uh, the RBS reduction is expected to be 50 to 70 milligram per day per hour. Uh, uh, faster than that reduction is not recommended because of increased risk of uh, uh, cerebral edema, okay? If our base is not, is not getting lower at this rate, you have to increase uh, uh, double the, the infusion rate until this uh, 50 to 70 milligram per hour reduction is achieved. What to do when the R base gets down uh, below 200 to 250, lower the infusion rate, okay? And change the, uh, the fluid to dextrose containing uh, solutions, okay? How long to continue the continuous uh, infusion until ketoacidosis is resolved? 
then the glucose is uh, lower than 200. Okay, and you have to start subcutaneous insulin before continuing the, the IV insulin. Okay, what about the use of uh, fast-acting insulin uh, analogs in uh, severe DKA? There are no studies to support their use, so they are not recommended for uh, uh, moderate to severe DKA and IV route. So uh, what about giving them subcutaneous? Because of the dehydration, the subcutaneous absorption will be slow. Uh, and they are not recommended. Okay, so use uh, commonly found cheaper old human insulin, regular insulin for severe to mild, moderate to severe decay. What about mild decay? Uh, subcutaneous insulin is, is, is possible, either regular insulin or uh, the rapid acting insulin analogs. The least pro aspart pre is possible in mild decay, subcutaneous food, not IV. Okay, the problem is in uh, dehydrated patients, uh, uh, the subcutaneous absorption is impaired. So what insulin to use? Use regular insulin. If possible, continuous infusion. Okay, these are, these are some of the criteria to use uh, subcutaneous rapid acting insulin because in the beginning I told you that uh, we have a donation of more than 50,000 doses of uh, rapid acting uh, uh, analog insulin, including rapid acting insulin. So you, should, you, should, you guys should be familiarized how to use them in DK. Okay, the only indication is to use them in mild DK subcutaneous route. Okay, uh, when the patient is alert, able to tolerate oral intake, oral intake there is no significant acidosis with pH um, above uh, seven and mild uh, acidosis with bicarb uh, above 10. Okay, this is a dose of uh, rapid acting insulin. Initial bolus 0.3 per kg, followed by maintenance uh, 0.2 unit per kg every one to two hour. When to convert, when to lower the glucose, when to change the fluid to DNS is the same as that of regular insulin. The other is fixing uh, uh, the precipitants. Okay, if you have focus of infection, treat it with uh, antibiotic, uh, adequate uh, treatment of the physical stress like surgery, burn, trauma, and so on. And uh, uh, psychologic therapy, psychosocial support therapy is recommended because especially uh, type one diabetic patients in puberty, they have a problem of body image, gaining weight from insulin. That's why they uh, stop insulin and go to BKA. So that you have to counsel that. Social stresses should be uh, addressed, and uh, uh, school age children uh, uh, during exam time have significant stress with uh, insulin mist uh, resulting in decay. So you, have, you need uh, psychosocial support, okay? And you should provide a quality health education about dosing and not to miss insulin uh, uh, so that you prevent subsequent decay. So this is a summary, a complex, uh, a more complex. When you look at it in the first place uh, from up to date, so the first thing is uh, to give IV fluids. Okay, what uh, type of fluids is isotonic fluid? How to give it depends on the volume status. Okay, if there's a significant shock, give a bolus fluids. If there's a hypovolemia, you give about one liter in the first hour and subsequently based on hydration status. Uh, the second is correcting electrolyte. If you have adequate urine and no electrolyte measurement, please give uh, potassium. Uh, the only uh, time to stop potassium is if you have hyperkalemia, more than 5.3. The third is uh, insulin therapy. So IV route is the most uh, uh, preferred route. So they, uh, you give 0.1 unit per kg bolus followed by 0.1 unit per kg per hour continuous infusion, okay? For mild decay, you can use a subcutaneous route, as we said. Rapid acting uh, analogs can be used, okay? For how long to continue? Insulin therapy until the ketosis is resolved. Uh, the hyperglycemia has come down to less than 100, uh, uh, and mental status improved in patients with HHS. Okay, so what are the criteria uh, for resolution of DK? We said glucose less than 200. Uh, for patients with uh, HHS, we can uh, keep the glucose about 250 because too much lowering from too high. Uh, can result in uh, uh, cerebral edema, okay? And ketos has resolved with uh, normalization of uh, anion gap and uh, blood keto level has resolved, okay? And normalization of mental status and patient uh, uh, able to eat. Okay, urine ketone testing is not recommended for uh, uh, to document resolution of DK because, uh, because uh, the testing used for urine ketone is a nitroprusside test. It reacts to the slowly cleared uh, acetone. 
uh, from urine. So it's not, if you still have a plus one, plus two uh, uh, urine ketone with uh, normalized glucose, normalized mental status, uh, it's okay to shift to subcutaneous insulin. But we are, when you are initiating subcutaneous insulin, you have to overlap the IV and subcutaneous insulin, okay? For at least one to two hour, uh, overlapping is recommended because the absorption from sub subcutaneous insulin takes time uh, so that they could rebound uh, or uh, go to decay again uh, if you don't overlap, okay? How to initiate subcutaneous insulin? Uh, if there are new patients that initially present with DKA, you can start a multiple daily injection with basal bolus insulin regimen at a dose of 0.5 units per kg per day. Or if they are, if they were a known uh, patient, you can start a pre-DKA or the previous uh, insulin dose. Okay, so this is a national algorithm for uh, uh, DKA management. The criteria are the same: hyperglycemia, uh, ketone urea, uh, two plus two or more ketonuria and glycosuria, and HHS severe hyperglycemia, more than 600, change mental status and dehydration are the, the diagnostic criteria put forward in, in our national, Ethiopian national guideline. Uh, and the laboratory parameters are the same as what we discussed. The monitoring is the same, blood, blood glucose every hour, ketones every two hour, uh, and uh, vital sign and fluid status monitoring. And uh, the insulin regimen uh, put forward. This is for health center and primary care setting. Okay, in hospitals and above, you can use a continuous uh, insulin infusion. So the initial bolus is about 10 unit IV, IM and 10 unit uh, IV, followed by uh, five to 10 unit uh, uh, hourly uh, IV insulin, regular insulin bolus. Okay, the diagnostic criteria for uh, resolution and when to switch to. Uh, subcutaneous insulin is the same as what we discussed before. So what are the complications? So cerebral edema is a common fatal complication uh, in children. Okay, it's rare in adults. The mechanism of cerebral edema is uh, because of uh, uh, change in the tonicity uh, in the brain. Okay, rapid uh, glycemic drop, rapid electrolyte changes, the fluid we are pumping, all of these results in cerebral edema. The, the initial clinical manifestation is a headache with change mentation and some of uh, focal neurologic deficit could be there. How to treat it is one thing is uh, uh, initial cautious fluid administration and glycemic management. Uh, the other is uh, um, ICP management, including manitol, head of bed elevation, uh, if it's not picked and treated early. The other is uh, overzealous insulin administration can cause uh, hypoglycemia. Electrolyte arrangements we discussed uh, can cause uh, arrhythmia, fatal arrhythmia, if not picked and treated uh, at, uh, timely. Okay, the other is because of the dehydration, uh, the, the shock state, acute kidney injury is possible. The other uh, patients with uh, DK and HHS that are increased of infection with sepsis, aspiration, and uh, notorious fungal infection, mucormycosis, uh, could be could happen in patients with hyperglycemic crisis. Okay, so this is the end of our discussion. Uh, why do we discuss this uh, hyperglycemic crisis? Uh, because these things, the prevalence we said in the Western, even in the Western, is increasing, while we have insulin for more than hundred years. Okay, one of the reasons is because of uh, access to insulin and other essential diabetes therapy is still limited. So this was the, uh, the theme of this year's uh, World Diabetes Day, okay? The access to diabetes care, if not now, when? Okay, yes, all of us uh, should advocate, be advocate, advocate for our patients. We should, uh, all our uh, insulin requiring patients should have access to it for free, okay? Uh, thank you for listening. Any questions raised? Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Malaku. Uh, if anybody have a question, I think there is already, people are already raising their hands. You can unmute yourself, uh, Dr. Tamru. You can uh, unmute yourself and ask. Thank you, Dr. Malaku. Uh, it's a nice presentation. 
I want to raise one question in our setup. Uh, strength uh, when managing uh, severe DK patient, we use uh, usually one uh, insulin, 10 international unit, IM and the IV start, uh, following with uh, 0.1 uh, insulin or 0.5 international unit every one hour. Uh, is there a scientific background about using 10 international unit IM and uh, subcutaneous? Thank you. So I showed you in one of the slides that uh, both the intravenous, uh, intramuscular and subcutaneous route of insulin administration were studied, compared uh, in several uh, small clinical trials. Uh, so the outcome was, was the outcome, the major outcome was resolution of decay and the time to discharge, time to uh, decay resolution. All of, the, all of the studies results in the same uh, finding. The only uh, difference was in the first one to two hour of uh, decay management, the rate of uh, RE base decline and the rate of uh, acidosis decline was better in IV, uh, uh, IV route. Okay, that's why IV route is more advocated now. Uh, so it's, it's possible to use any of the, the routes, in, especially in mild decay, they can't even be treated with the subcutaneous route. Okay, thank you. Great. Uh, Fasil Getacho, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, it was a really nice presentation. Uh, my question uh, is on the management of uh, DKA, uh, particularly in decompensated patients, uh, especially in pediatric patients with severe acute malnutrition. And uh, in adult patients with cancer, is there any difference in the management, especially with regard to the fluid and electrolyte administration? Uh, that's my question. Thank you. I'm afraid I, I might not uh, answer your question well uh, because I don't practice pediatrics uh, uh, no more. But uh, uh, one thing I could remember is you should be cautious with, uh, with fluid therapy because these patients are at risk of, at, at, are at risk of uh, uh, fluid overload. If anyone around uh, from pediatrics, they can help you more. Okay, thank you, doctor. Uh, Dr. Tegis Bacha is here with us. Uh, if you can, uh, you can ask your question. And you can unmute oh, yourself. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you, Dr. Malako and uh, Blue Hills for the nice presentation. I learned so much. Um, I'm from pediatrics. Uh, regarding malnutrition, I think it's uh, still a difficult question. There are uh, some case reports and so on, and uh, it's uh, still challenging. Uh, do we need to give the same amount of fluid and so on? Is like, uh, still a, a big debate. But uh, we we tell people like I mean uh, our uh, physicians to be really careful when you, they give uh, IV fluids for severe decays, and for a mild one we try to manage with PO. So. That's what we do. But, and uh, I have one question, Malaku, like um, you said when uh, random blood sugar is less than 250 to use 5% dextrose. Is that with normal saline or with half normal saline or with just plain? Because uh, I, I see often like people put five, uh, DW and which is a very hypotonic fluid for a DK patient. My other question is like, uh, we usually teach to decrease the insulin infusion if, if uh, the patient is unresponsive for hypokalemia despite potassium administration for severe hypokalemia, or if the random blood sugar drops by 100 milligram per deciliter per hour. Uh, usually these are the two, the two uh, challenge, uh, I mean, time that we, or if the patient is really hypoglycemic, despite our increment of the uh, glucose concentration. Uh, but what is your practice in adults? Like, when do you like to decrease? For all less than 200, or, uh, or do you have a specific reason? Uh, thank, thank you, you Dr. Tegis. You have been an inspiration to me and all of us uh, in the Grand Bazaar. And nice 
to see you again. Uh, it's a privilege uh, to give a speech with you in the uh, stage uh, about uh, to what fluid to add uh, dextrose. It depends on the electrolyte uh, electrolyte panel. If the sodium is, we say that if the corrected sodium is low, you have to continue using uh, uh, isotonic fluid. So it depends on the sodium status uh, of the patient. The sodium corrected sodium is low. You have to add that that uh, uh, glucose dextrose into an isotonic, an isotonic fluid. Uh, about second question, I'm not sure if I catch it right. Uh, Dr. Tegist, you're, uh, you're still muted. Okay, I saw some uh, mm -hmm. some questions on the chat box. The first thing is from... Uh, oh, there's also someone um, who raised uh, his hands. Uh, maybe we can take him and okay. after we can go to the... Dr. Gaetane, okay. you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Dr. Malako. Is it audible? Yes, uh, we can hear you. We continue your. Question. Yeah, thank thank you for your nice presentation. And uh, my question was, uh, when uh, DKA management, it should be the patient should be out of DKA within uh, the first twenty four hours. If the patient is not out of DKA within uh, the first twenty four hours, uh, some physicians uh, recommend. The patient uh, to give uh, PO feeding and uh, then restart the management. Uh, can you clarify this one? Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Geta. This is, uh, I practice an evidence based medicine. Uh, what you said is, uh, uh, is a personal uh, uh, practice, but so we should all adhere to the, uh, the evidences that support better outcome. Okay, so uh, so DK and HHS should be should be resolving uh, as much as they were occurring. We said DK and HHS uh, evolve over 24 to 36 or 48 hours, so they should come out of that at the same time. Okay, so if they are not resolving, there is there is a mismanagement. So that's why we have uh, this update as well. Uh, I think another one raised his hands. Uh, Omar Mohammed, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. You are still muted. Uh, Omar, you are, you are still muted. Okay, thank you. I think you can hear me now. Yes, yes, continue. Okay. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Malaku for his uh, really nice presentation. And, uh, and my question is uh, uh, regarding the practice of uh, this uh, PO fluid administration. What are the evidences in uh, uh, studies, uh, practices, as Dr. Tegist also mentioned, especially in severely malnourished patients? You, we usually see practices uh, during my internship practices in different uh, schools. I, I also saw that uh, pure uh, ma management of uh, fluid. So what are the evidences? And is there any studies and uh, are there any practices outside our country uh, for that? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Omar. So my DK, uh, usually resolves over six to 12 hours uh, and a patient uh, alert, able to take uh, oral uh, uh, PO feeding and fluid uh, can be treated with uh, oral fluid and subcutaneous uh, insulin only for short time. They can stay in the ED for six to 12 hours and discharged early. Okay, if there's nothing 
gets to make them uh, 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 stay. So the point is there is no one size fit all uh, fluid therapy for all patients with decay. It's, it, depend, it depends on the severity, the perceptant, uh, and the response to our uh, uh, oral therapy and subcutaneous insulin therapy. So this, what you said is for patients really well uh, with mild decay uh, patients that can be discharged early, as early as 12 hours from the ED. Do you have evidences in our country? Uh, I don't think we have uh, good evidence on any topic in our country. We use the Western data. Uh, so this is an assignment for all of us. Uh, for, for the mild, uh, there is ISPAD, so, uh, International Society for uh, Pediatric and Adolescent uh, Guideline. It recommends mild for mild decay to give uh, fluids which are uh, which are like ORS or uh, home based fluids, uh, or if also if it's also for moderate, if in a really primary hospital, I mean at a low level resource places. Uh, during their referral to, to give that one. Otherwise, based settings, they use uh, uh, maintenance IV fluid with maintenance fluid. Thinking mild dehydration has 5% uh, dehydration, they add on their maintenance 5%. If it is moderate, around 7%. And uh, in severe cases, 8.5 up to 10% uh, deficits will be added on the maintenance. So uh, the fluid in IV is a little different for mild, moderate, severe. But for mild ones, it's possible also to use a few few fluids. As far as the kidney is working, IV fluids also can be used in uh, mild cases, uh, considering the deficit as five percent. Thank you. Great. Uh, so we have a to augment. Okay. Continue. Uh, sorry to augment this talk. Uh, we often advise patients to have, uh, uh, in the Western setup, a home uh, urine ketone testing uh, meters, ketometers, okay? So if, if they have uh, mild hyperglycemia, mild ketosis, uh, they can't even treat it at home with increased fluid intake, uh, with any of the fluid formulations that Dr. Gustav said. And so mild is, is, uh, is not worrisome. It's, it's treated early. Uh, some of questions from uh, the chat box. The first question is uh, about modified sliding scale after they are uh, shifted to subcutaneous insulin. I think we should, you, you guys should all delete uh, sliding scale from uh, your vocabulary. Uh, so there is, no, uh, such, there is no recommendation about sliding scale. Sliding scale is you slide with, the, with the sugar and you correct it after the hyperglycemia has uh, occurred. Okay, it's a retroactive uh, action. So in diabetes management, we should be proactive, prevent hyperglycemia from, uh, from, the, from the beginning. Okay, so you should put them on uh, basal uh, uh, insulin plus uh, prandial and correction as needed. There is no, uh, there is no sliding scale uh, in, in diabetes vocabulary anymore. The second question is uh, hypercoagulability in decay. This is a very uh, nice uh, uh, issue raised. So uh, decay and HHS are characterized by hyperinflammatory condition. Okay, there is increased inflammatory state, increased cytokines. Uh, this is uh, as, uh, any form of uh, hyperinflammatory state, including COVID, as you might know, is associated with uh, hypercoagulability. So they are at increased uh, risk of uh, 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 hypercoagulability, so all of them, all of our admitted patients should be on prophylaxis heparin. The third question is uh, rate of KCL infusion. Uh, if you are talking about a primary care setting with a, a small peripheral uh, IV line, you can uh, go as high as 40 to 60 milliequivalent uh, in larger amount of fluid. Otherwise, larger amount of uh, KCL should be given in central line. The, the last question raised is also important. What about fluid management in, uh, in already fluid overloaded states like heart failure and CKD? We said there is no one size fits all fluid approach in a hyperglycemic crisis. So you should individualize 
uh, and it should be based on the fluid status. You don't pump all that uh, calculated uh, 20 uh, ml per kg and so on for an, an already overloaded state. So you should individualize based on the patient's fluid status. You are right. In patients with CKD and uh, extremes of age, heart failure, uh, malnourished, you should be cautious with fluid administration. How much to give depends on uh, your monitoring, okay? Hemodynamic status monitoring. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, I think we have a, a limited time. Uh, we've already gone past uh, one hour. So we would really like to thank uh, Dr. Amalaku for this amazing presentation. I hope we all uh, got something from it. Uh, uh, we, we could have uh, took some uh, uh, questions, but we have a really lim limited time. Maybe on the next session, we can invite another guest and we would have more uh, time. Uh, we thank you all for your participation. Uh, I hope you guys got something really important from this webinar. And as uh, Blue Hulls, we will continue uh, uh, providing this kind of uh, uh, webinars in the future. And uh, if you have any kind of comments on the webinar or, or on uh, who we, we can invite on the on the next or on the future uh, webinars, you can co comment us and thank you all. Have a great night.